Welcome to Bigfoot Case Files. We are located on Vancouver Island, British Columbia, and are interested in hearing of any encounters or sightings from here on the island. If you've had an encounter or sighting, please give us a call or text us your experience at 778-227-7588. We're really looking forward to hearing from you. Historical Cases of Encounters with Bigfoot, Part 70 1978. Bigfoot isn't dog's best friend. Orient, Washington. John French and a friend were driving last night in the Jasper Mountain area when nature called. French was relieving himself in some nearby bushes when he heard a noise not found in his animal sounds inventory. It was a very deep guttural sound, unlike any he had heard in all his years of hunting and fishing in the backcountry around Colville. It sounded like a warning to French and his buddy, so they made a hasty retreat back to town. French related his experience to another buddy who had a huge German shepherd who was rumored to have kicked butt on every dog around for miles. The dog's name was Captain Hook, Hook for short, and he wasn't afraid of anything. He'd jump right into the pickup bed and he'd jump right out on command, French stated. They put Hook in the pickup and headed to the area of the strange sounds. When they got there, the dog stayed in the bed of the truck, cowering in the corner. The frightened canine had apparently sensed something he did not like, and no commands would make him budge. His owner finally yanked him out, but he remained where he landed, quivering with fear. French and his buddy scouted the area and found some very large footprints and a tree that had been recently twisted off at the top. French tried to step in the footprints and match the pace, but ended up doing the splits. The story goes that shortly after his Bigfoot experience, Hook did a split for a safer home and was never seen again. 1982, December 10th, Footprint Mismatch, a real teaser, Brandon, Manitoba. A long line of unusual footprints found in fresh snow on the farm of Bob Woodfield is out of step with wildlife naturalists. The 19-inch long and 8-inch wide prints have three toes with an interval between prints of about 39 inches. They extend for nearly a mile through a ravine, over a barbed wire fence, and across a field to Woodfield's property. Provincial government conservationist Sid Roback, part of the naturalist's team that examined the prints, stated, All I can tell is there's no animal like this listed under the Wildlife Act. The naturalists measured and photographed the prints and made plaster casts of some of them. Woodfield, whose farm is about 106 miles from Winnipeg, remarked, If it's someone pulling a practical joke, they went to a lot of trouble. Comment, Three toad tracks have been found, photographed, and cast at other locations, and have been associated with Sasquatch. 1986, August. Lazy Sasquatch Snatches Fish Catch. Chilliwack River, British Columbia. A vacationing elderly couple, Bobby and Kathy Harris, have a fish story they will never forget. They were angling in the Chilliwack River on a hot summer afternoon. Bobby had just returned to the river after hanging his catch of about eight fish on a tree near their camper. He had not finished his first cast when Kathy cried out in alarm and pointed back to the tree. Bobby looked in stunned silence, still holding his fishing pole halfway through a cast. To the couple's astonishment, a dark gray, hair-covered creature walking on two legs grabbed the fish from the tree and walked off through the bush. It crossed a nearby road and disappeared into the forest on the other side. Bobby and Kathy stood and stared like statues. Finally, Kathy broke the silence. What the heck was that? she exclaimed. That was Bigfoot, and I still don't believe it, Bobby replied. The Harrises weren't the only witnesses to the unusual theft. At least two other campers elsewhere in the campsite saw what happened and rushed up to the Harrises' camper. The creature was not seen again, and the hardy Harris couple recovered from the incident. They stayed on for another two days and happily replaced the stolen stash with a fresh catch. After hearing of the incident from one of the other witnesses who had left the day after the encounter, researcher Thomas Steenberg arrived at the site just as the Harris couple was pulling out. He was able to talk to them briefly and got a first-hand account of the incident. Steenberg had a good look around the campsite and then decided to venture into the forest across the road where the creature disappeared, directly behind the campsite. 
Along a small creek that flows into the river, he found a line of footprints, each measuring up to 18 inches, depending on the soil. The line of prints headed north through a grassy clearing and disappeared at a rock slide area. In all, 112 footprint impressions were counted. The prints were photographed and a cast made of the best print. 1989, August 21st, Harry Wildman apprehended in Apple Orchard, Sartova region, Russia. Four Apple Orchard guards apprehended an intruder who, to their surprise, was a naked, hairy wild man. The first guard to reach and tackle the wild man was immediately overpowered by the man's superior strength and sickened by his terrible stench. The other guards rushed to their comrade's assistance and the wild man was subdued. The guards had just enough rope with them to bind his arms. Not really sure what they should now do with the oddity, they carried him to their car and bundled him into the trunk. They then telephoned the local militia station and were told to hold the wild man overnight and that authorities would come out in the morning. Not wishing to leave the wild man in the car trunk overnight, they asked permission to put him in the Apple storeroom. The person in charge flatly refused this request. The group returned to the orchard, which by this time had grown dark. Having been in the trunk for some three hours, the wild man was thrashing about furiously. One guard, Sergei, went to check to make certain the trunk was locked. He inadvertently sprung the trunk lid, and the wild man, who had worked out of his bindings, leaped out. He remained motionless for a moment and then bounded off into the darkness. The incident was subsequently investigated by hominologists. The details gathered on the creature were as follows. It was about six feet tall and weighed 220 to 265 pounds. It was covered in hair except for the palms and soles of its feet, which showed evidence of many cuts. The skin on its face was dark, the nose flat, the teeth yellow, and the forehead very slanting. Black-footed Bigfoot seen by Hunter, Adams County, Ohio, Forest Area, May 1995. A hunter reported that while waiting for deer to come by his position, he heard loud thumping. He sensed a strange odor, and upon looking in the direction of the thumping, he saw the back of a huge Bigfoot-type creature. He noted that the soles of the creature's feet were black. Investigators went to the area and found what appeared to be a large handprint. The print is about 10 inches in length from what appears to be the beginning of the palm to the tip of the longest finger. By comparison, a human male hand, 6 feet 200 pounds, would be about 8 inches in length. 1995, August 28th, Redwoods Rogue Bigfoot captured on video. Redwood State Park, California. A television film crew that included a former Playboy playmate in a large recreational vehicle filmed a supposed Sasquatch while traveling through Jedediah Smith Redwood State Park in Northern California. The sighting occurred after nightfall when the driver pulled onto a side road. He alerted everyone to what he thought was a bear up ahead illuminated by the vehicle's headlights. It was then observed that the creature walked on two legs and had the appearance of a Sasquatch, estimated at about eight feet tall. The driver put the vehicle's lights on high beam and the creature raised its arms defensively. At this time, it was about 15 feet in front of the RV. It then moved off into the forest, pausing once to glare back at the intruders. Unfortunately, some of the details the film crew reported are not seen in the video. The crew's cameraman, Craig Miller, took the 27-second video. We are told that the crew was constantly filming the sights, thus the reason for the quick action in getting the video footage. The film has been intently studied and cannot be proven to be either a hoax or authentic because of its poor quality. Some details seem to indicate authenticity, others the reverse. Oddly, the film shows the creature crossing the road from left to right and then recrossing from right to left. Adams County, Ohio, Forest Area, July. A retired police officer reported that he noticed an unusual odor while out hunting. He looked around and saw a black ape-like creature between six and a half and seven feet in height standing by a large tree. The creature was looking, staring at him. He quickly left the scene. 
1997, June 26th, resident reports ape in her yard, Duncansville, Ohio. A lady resident here stated that she saw a strange creature in her front yard. She was watching television at some time between midnight and 1 a.m. when she heard her dogs barking outside. She turned on the porch light and observed the creature, which was about 30 feet away. She described the oddity as being between three and four feet tall, covered in gray fur or hair about one and a half inches long, large dark eyes, rounded ears that extended above its head, very long arms and a short tail. It made a gurgling sound. The creature looked at her for a few moments and then knuckle-walked away like a chimpanzee. She said it appeared to sort of skip as it moved. Mother claims child was fathered by Chinese wild man. On October 10, 1997, an interesting Bigfoot-related article appeared in the World Journal, a Chinese newspaper. The article states the following. A woman who works for the Bigfoot Research Center in China was going through the belongings of her recently deceased father. Her father had been with the Wildlife Research Center in China. She found a 1986 videotape of a 33-year-old man from a very remote forested area of China with the following unusual attributes. Great height, about 2 meters or 6 feet 6 inches, small head, body proportions, torso, arms and legs similar to those of the North American Bigfoot, a tail or something that looked like it, long stride, inability to speak. However, he did not have any noticeable body hair. The mother of the man was still alive when the video was taken. She stated that she had been abducted by a wild man after the death of her husband. The child was an offspring of her relationship with the wild man. The woman previously had a son by her husband. This son, an officer in the army, persuaded his mother to tell her story to the wildlife research people. She did so on condition that the research people not reveal her identity while she was alive because of her shame. The article goes on to state that Chinese wild men have been recorded as far back as 100 to 200 BC. It also mentions that a monkey boy was discovered in 1932, but only reported posthumously. Psychologist eyes Bigfoot eyeing wife and child. Hood River, Oregon Caves, July 2000. Dr. Matthew Johnson, a clinical psychologist, reported that he sighted a Bigfoot while out hiking with his family, wife and three children, near the Oregon Caves. As it happened, Johnson and his wife heard unusual sounds as they walked along the hiking trail. Johnson ran ahead of his family and climbed a hill to where he could look down on the trail. He observed a Bigfoot about 70 to 90 feet away that was looking at his family from behind a tree. Johnson rushed back to his wife and children and hurried them to safety. This experience led him to later look for physical evidence of the creature, whereupon he found footprints of different sizes. He thereupon invited Dr. William York, a primatologist, to go to the area with him. The two men found three sets of footprints, a bedding construction composed of forest material and what they termed a squatting area. Johnson subsequently formed the Southern Oregon Bigfoot Society and has performed ongoing research in the Oregon Caves region. Different types of food have been put out and apparently taken by the creatures. There have been further sightings, but at night, and they have been too brief to observe any details. Bigfoot reported seen at 3 a.m. in town of Starbuck. Starbuck, Washington, January 27, 2000. According to an anonymous source, a Bigfoot visited the town of Starbuck. The resident, who lives close to the Tucannon River, went out to get firewood at about 3 a.m. After a few steps, he saw a Bigfoot standing between his woodpile and a fir tree approximately 20 feet away. He ran back into his house, locked the door, and remained inside until the next morning. He stated that the Bigfoot was 7 feet tall, had grayish-brown hair, was very muscular, and stood upright. Rick Ferguson, the postmaster and deputy, passed on this information. Ferguson said he knew the man well and could vouch for his credibility. As to the reason for the visit, one theory is that the heavy snow in the mountains at this time of year may cause the creatures to come down to lower elevations to look for food. Standoff at Blacksnake Ridge, Washington, 
November 1998. A local logger had a long encounter with a Bigfoot while heading towards Dixie. He first spotted the creature moving on an open slope some three quarters of a mile away, but he didn't realize what it was. He estimated about where on the road he would likely cross its path. As his rig came into the curve at the end of a long grade in the road, the two met, with only about 40 to 45 yards separating them. The logger stopped his truck and approached the creature on foot. He got close enough to note a number of physical details. During this time, the creature simply stared back at him. It then walked away with a curious limp. The logger, who does not wish to be identified, was interviewed in person by reporters Vance Orchard and Bill Laffery of the Times of Waitsburg on May 4, 2000. The following is the detailed information he provided, starting from when he first sighted the creature in the distance. All that time, I'm wondering what kind of animal it was. It never entered my mind that it was going to be a Bigfoot. As I got there and saw him, I stopped my truck and shut off the motor. He was standing there in a heavy tusted grassy area, just standing and looking at me. We both eyeballed each other real good. Pretty soon, I was close enough I could see his facial expressions. He didn't look like an ape in the face, more like man features, but hairy in the face. I would say he had a nose, but not much. The skin was black, and his hair color was like this. He pulled out a smoky blue ski hat out of his truck cab. He was about this color and had gray hairs showing like an old dog will get around his nose. Anyway, while he was standing there, the expression on his face changed three or four times. That led me to believe that man may not be the only animal that has reasoning. This old boy was thinking, and every time he'd go to a different train of thought, his expression would change. Asked if he could see the creature's eyes, he responded, I wasn't really interested in that. I was looking at the width of his shoulders and his height, wondering what the hell was going to happen. He was a good yard or more through the shoulders, and I've had people tell me how a Bigfoot is about 8 feet tall. Well, this dude was taller than 8 feet and closer to 9 feet tall. When you're that close, it's no problem to figure out how big it was, and he never made any effort to run from me. He never acted like he was scared. I sure know he wasn't scared of me, not a bit. Then he turned and walked along this way. He simulated a limping gait, like something was wrong with one leg, like he had an old injury or someone had shot him. Then he stopped and turned and looked at me for another full minute before he left. Didn't run, he just walked over to the edge of the brush that dropped off steeply into the dry creek north fork. There was no getting around it. This was not any man-made object or a man dressed up. There isn't a man in this county big enough to wear that suit. The logger said that this sighting was his first Bigfoot encounter, although several years ago he saw something that he thought was a bear standing up. He explained, I always thought it was a Bigfoot, but could find no sign. But this time it's different. Absolutely no doubt about it. I would pull a $50 bill out of my own pocket, though, if one of you guys could have been there with me. I don't know whether to say anything to anyone about this. You know, if I'd go downtown and tell the guys I saw a Bigfoot, They'd laughed me clear out of the place. I told my wife about it, and she kind of had her doubts about it for a while, but she knew I wasn't going to come in with some kind of cock and bull story to take a ridiculing over. But I really don't care what people think. I just didn't talk about it, except with someone who has seen a Bigfoot or is a serious believer. They can believe what they want, but I'm the one who knows what I saw. They can say there's no such thing, but they don't have anything to back that up, and I do. This thing was the closest to a real human than anything I've seen on television or real life. His body is proportioned more to a human than anything I've ever seen. He's not like an ape. This dude walked like a man and somehow acts like a man. He walked like he was crippled in the right leg or foot. I'll tell you this much too. I've never seen anything like it before or since. He's a one of a kind for me. A Family Affair in the Blue Mountains, Walla Walla, Washington, October 2000. A couple on a scenic drive through the Blue Mountains on Jasper Mountain Road got quite a surprise as they rounded a curve. Peter and Karen were nine miles off U.S. Highway 12 when Peter saw a large, hairy, two-legged animal step over a barbed wire fence, cross the road, and disappear into the bush. Peter shouted, Elk! No! What the hell is that? 
Karen was on the lookout for ruts in the gravel road, but glanced up in time to also see the creature cross and enter the brush. Karen shouted, Oh my God, what was that? However, she instinctively knew they had seen a Bigfoot. The couple drove down the road a short distance and stopped. Peter wanted to go back and check things out further. Although Karen was petrified with fear, she agreed. Peter backed up the truck to the area of the crossing and then got out his gun and a flashlight to peer into any dark recesses. He walked across the road where the Bigfoot had entered the bush and found the exact spot. He then proceeded to inspect the fence on the other side of the road. As he got closer to the fence, a deep, guttural sound came from beyond. Karen shouted, Pete, did you hear that? He said yes and moved closer to the fence. Karen then jumped out of the truck and pleaded with him not to go over the fence. When he said that he had to, she shouted, No, we have been warned. From the other side of the road, they heard movement in the bush. Then they heard another deep, guttural sound from over the fence, followed by the same sound from across the road. Karen told Pete that her woman's instinct said there was a baby Bigfoot still over the fence, and the mama was warning them to back off. Karen didn't want them caught in the middle if a parent was separated from its child. Pete reluctantly saw things Karen's way, and they drove home, still stunned by their experience. At home, they collected their thoughts and both agreed that they had seen a female Bigfoot, around seven feet tall, with long, but not shaggy, buckskin-colored hair. Pete vividly remembered its lean muscles down to its hips and legs, together with the extremely long paces it took when it crossed the road. Karen recalled her deceased father telling her as a child that Bigfoot were part of the local forest, just like all other animals. The next day, they returned to the spot of the sighting to see if they could find and cast any footprints. They explored the whole area and found 14-inch, 16-inch, and 8-inch tracks. They cast the 14-inch track. Unfortunately, they did not bring enough plaster for the other tracks. As they continued their explorations, things became very quiet. Peter wanted to carry on, but Karen said no, and before she could say it, Peter whispered, We're not alone. With that, they left the area immediately. Bigfoot Visits Downtown Walla Walla, Washington, January 2001 Harley McAllis and a friend were taking a winter walk along a creek when they spotted very large tracks accompanied by smaller tracks in the snow, much like an adult and a youngster, except in giant proportions. The larger tracks were about 18 to 20 inches long and 9 to 10 inches wide. They were deeply compressed in the snow, much deeper than human prints. Both sets were made by bare feet, showing distinct toes, ball, arch, and heel. The pace of the larger tracks was in the order of four feet, and the smaller set two feet. Both sets indicated a bipedal creature. Brian Smith, a local Bigfoot investigator, thoroughly searched both sides of the creek a few days later and stated that he found similar tracks on the other side of the creek. Elk Watcher Gets an Eyeful of Bigfoot Black Snake Ridge, Walla Walla, Washington, April 26, 2001 A woman elk watching with binoculars during an outing with friends claims she saw a Bigfoot about 500 yards away. She stated that she saw it walk along with pronounced strides and swinging arms for some time before it came to a logging road which it crossed before disappearing into a bush. She estimated its height to be at least 8 feet and that it certainly was a Bigfoot, not a bear. The woman alerted her friends to the anomaly, but they did not believe her and kept looking in other directions. The sighting drew the attention of Dateline Discover and the Today Show television programs, along with members of the North American Ape Project. Two weeks after the sighting, people from these organizations visited the area. While the team was unable to get access to the privately owned land where the Bigfoot walked in Laird Canyon, they did get to the spot where the lady had viewed the creature. Using strong binoculars, they could see tracks in the fresh snow in the area where the creature had been sighted. This observation led to speculation that the area was a possible migratory route for the creature. Fast-footed Bigfoot spotted on Mill Creek Road, Walla Walla, Washington, October 14, 2001. Brian Smith, a Sasquatch researcher, sighted a Sasquatch at about 10.30 p.m. on Mill Creek Road. 
Smith was heading up into the mountains to broadcast some previously recorded Bigfoot vocalizations for his research. The creature dashed across the road about 50 or 60 feet in front of his vehicle. It was going real fast, he stated. One step was on the side of the road, the next was in the middle, and by the third step, it was on the other side and dashing off into the area where some cabins were located. Smith was not the only one on the road at that point. Another car was coming towards me and must have been within 30 or 40 feet of the thing, Smith said. They came to a stop, but soon went on, apparently not wanting to stop to talk about the happening. Smith said the Bigfoot was brown in color and at least 8 feet tall. For Smith, this sighting makes three Bigfoot he has seen. Snacking Bigfoot Ignores Onlookers Black Snake Ridge, Washington, October 1, 2001 A woman and her son were driving to their cabin in the upper reaches of Black Snake Ridge around 6 p.m. The woman's son was driving the car. She spotted what she first thought was a reddish-colored cow. It was sitting on the road embankment, eating something. They passed within 10 to 15 feet of the creature, and the woman looked it right in the eye. Now revealed as a Bigfoot, it just ignored her and continued eating. The woman described it as being very broad, with a head shaped like that of a baboon's. Bigfoot researcher Brian Smith interviewed the woman and stated that when he checked out the site, he found a big pile of rosehip discards. Bentonville, Ohio, February 23, 2002 At about 11.30 p.m., two ladies, Dana Smith and Lauren Greer, heard unusual screaming and moaning in the woods near their Bentonville residence. The sounds lasted for five to ten minutes. When the ladies looked out into the darkness, they saw what they described as a big man. They telephoned the police, who investigated the incident, but did not find anything or anyone. The police subsequently told the ladies to contact Jody Cook at the Ohio Center for Bigfoot Studies in Cincinnati. The next day, Lauren Greer's brother, Tony Greer, scouted the area and found both an unusual hand impression and a roughly 17-inch footprint about 39 inches away. Tony, a hunter who has made plaster casts of animal tracks, made a cast of the hand impression. Unfortunately, the footprint was not good enough to cast. He then contacted Jody Cook, who went to investigate the incident. Tony informed Jody of what he felt were the circumstances and gave him the hand cast. Jody drew the illustration seen here. It appears the creature hopped up on a little bluff and in doing so, placed its left hand on the ground for leverage. The lower palm of the hand pressed down on a small tree branch that was pressed into the ground. The upper palm and four fingers went into the ground. As the cast showed dermal ridges, fingerprints, Jody had it professionally photographed. The photographs were subsequently sent to Jimmy Chilcutt, an expert in primate dermal ridges. Chilcutt identified the cast as a handprint of an adult gorilla. However, the cast index finger and little finger indicated that the creature was either in a post-mortem state or very near death. This conclusion raised suspicion that the print might have been made by a commercially available gorilla hand, such as those available from Bone Clones. The Bone Clones people were contacted, and they provided Chilcutt with cast fingerprints from their gorilla hand mold. The actual cast was then sent to Chilcutt for full investigation and comparison. The following is Chilcutt's official report on the cast. December 16, 2003 after a thorough examination and consultation with Dr. Jeff Meldrum, I've reached the conclusion that the cast is the left hand of an adult gorilla. The friction ridges visible on the fingertips are in a loop pattern with the core low to the first joint. This is a typical primate characteristic. Also note that the index and little fingers appear to be in a post-mortem state. The fingernails are thick, tapered, and arced, typical in great apes. The flexion creases are similar to humans, but the flexion creases, called the simian crease, is only found in primates. The texture of the ridges is more consistent with known human and non-human primate friction ridges than that of known Sasquatch friction ridges. The width of the hand is 6 inches, which is larger than any chimp I've printed, but I must confess, I haven't printed all the chimps in the world. 
These are the factors I've based my conclusion on. It can be argued that since no one has documented a Sasquatch handprint, and this handprint is that of a great ape, that it could be a Sasquatch handprint. My answer to that is the texture of known Sasquatch foot dermal ridges does not match the dermal ridges on this cast. I have found that the dermal ridge texture in both human and non-human primates stays consistent between feet and hands. Bigfoot seen near Bigfoot Researchers Memorial, Umatilla National Forest, Washington, July 28, 2002. A memorial dedicated to the noted late Bigfoot researcher, Wes Summerlin, just might have had a highly appropriate visitor. A fellow researcher, Brian Smith, along with Ann Westbrook and other friends, headed to a forest clearing where the memorial was to take place. They heard footsteps in the surrounding bush, and then the sound of something being thrown against a tree. After the memorial, the group heard the same walking sounds as they headed back to their cars. Anne and Brian decided to investigate and went closer to the source of the sounds. They spread out about 60 to 80 feet apart as they moved into the woods, and Brian then motioned Anne to start swinging in towards him. Anne looked down to make sure she wouldn't trip, and upon looking up, saw a large dark figure silently pass in front of a fallen tree about 100 yards away. She stopped dead in her tracks and looked for Brian. He was about 60 feet away walking towards her. When he was close enough, she told him what she had seen. They went over to the fallen tree, which they measured at four and a half feet off the ground. Anne estimated that the creature stood about three feet higher than the tree, indicating it was a good seven and a half feet tall. They looked around and found one good footprint in the immediate area and another impression further away where the creature had stepped on some flowers. End of entries. Sasquatch, Bigfoot Chronicle, and other unrecognized relic hominids and wildmen. Written by Christopher L. Murphy. Don't forget to enter the November giveaway contest. Just listen to the video linked on your screen and follow the instructions to enter. Thanks and good luck.